Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for being here on this Sunday morning. And we have we avoided the rain driving in. Let's hope we avoid the rain driving home. Yes? Yes. <laughs> okay, I can wait till we're, we're home and cozy in our houses. Well, for those of you who I have not met yet, my name is Megan Klink, and I am the new kid on the block at Komen. I am the CEO for Susan G. Komen Orange County, 17 months in. So if I haven't met you yet, please, I want to come find you. Oh, thank you. <laughs> I do want to get to know each and every single one of you here today. And welcome, welcome, welcome to our second annual Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference. Thank you so much for being here. My goodness, we had 300 individuals register to attend. So big, big deal. I know we still have some people filtering in. It's the morning, it's a Sunday. Uh, but we know we're gonna have everybody here. And we also have, we want to say hi to everyone on our live stream. We know, we don't know the numbers, but those of you on live stream, can you all, have everyone say hello to them. <laughs> hello. <laughs> there we go. Thank you so much. You know, and I think that the tagline for our conference is making connections, sharing science, stories, and support. How many of you have already met somebody new here today? Oh, I love that. I love that. And I've already heard so many incredible stories, shed a few tears this morning, uh, but certainly lots of beautiful connections. So more of that to come. That's wonderful. Well, let's get some of the housekeeping out of the way. The restrooms are located out of the doors and to your left. So important to know that. And you can, of course, feel free to use the restroom anytime that you need to. No hall pass needed. And uh, we also have some really, truly wonderful exhibitors that are here today. So please, on all of the scheduled breaks, take some time, go meet every single person that's here. There's some swag. It's also fun to get some fun swag at all the tables as well. And this year we have a new, truly powerful opportunity at the Pfizer booth. You may have already seen it because it's uh, near the restrooms. And they're asking that question. If you could say something directly to your breast cancer, what would you say? <laughs> I heard some laughs. <laughs> you have a chance to get that recorded. <laughs> Don't miss that. And so, and please also share what gives you strength, how you continue to live life on your terms. You know, and also, we do want to hear from you. We have in your blue tote bag, everyone got a blue tote bag, yes? Okay, so in that tote bag, there is this rather daunting looking survey. And I, I want to say in advance that we listen to all of your feedback, all except shortening the survey. <laughs> <laughs> for many reasons why we can't. I know it's long. I know that it's long, but it really is important. If you can just take a few moments after each session and give us your feedback. I think so many of you who I have seen and do know, you know that we take your feedback very seriously and we incorporate it. It's what drove us to have the clinical trial symposium in November. It is what has driven the programming for today and will continue to uh, be what sets the stage for the types of conversations and education and speakers that we bring forward for our MBC initiative. Okay, oh, I forgot that there's slides behind me. Thank you for whoever's doing that. Wonderful. All right, how many of you got a ticket when you registered? Do not, okay, good. Don't lose this ticket because this is the ticket to a really special spa experience with Spa Gregory's. Yes. So I apologize to those of you watching from home, but if you are here, we are gonna draw the ticket winner at the, uh, during the closing remarks this afternoon. You must be present to win, but it's gonna be something really great. So make sure you have, if you didn't get a ticket, uh, it, is all of, it is specifically for those of you who are living with metastatic breast cancer. If you need a ticket, please go see our registration table. Okay, housekeeping is over, let's get started. So today, what are we going to explore? We have on the agenda the opportunity to hear about up-to-date, cutting-edge MBC stage 4 breast cancer research, treatment information, and clinical trial opportunities. We also have ways that you and your families can live a healthy life via nutrition and mindfulness and other integrative and complementary medicine, uh, medicine modalities. And we're going to engage in a open forums that we hope, we hope, will create a united and unique voice to advance our goals in providing support to all of you who are diagnosed with MBC. 
And we do hope, please, that you use this opportunity this day to meet one another, to make connections, uh, just to understand that you are not alone and that while we know everyone has a unique experience, Coleman Orange County uh, and the community at large, we are here to listen and support you and to stand by your side. And together, we do wanna use our voices to elevate the importance and necessity of NBC Research to help you live longer lives. So thank you. And I do wanna give a huge, huge thank you to our Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference Planning Committee. For those of you who are here, can you please stand? You donated your time, your expertise, and coordinating every aspect. So please stand, let us give you a round of applause. Thank you so much. And I know we have a few board members here today. If you could also please stand and let us acknowledge you. Thank you very much, Dr. Lopez, Dr. Devere Herod. And also just, I wanna give a shout out before we go too far to the Coleman Orange County staff, especially our mission team, Ambrosia and Lauren and Laura Leslie. Thank you for all that you did to make this day happen. And certainly, we want to just acknowledge the incredible Orange County Hospital Systems, nonprofit partners, everyone who helped uh, provide experts for our breakout sessions, the speakers, the booths, and your financial support to make today possible. Thank you so, so much. And I do just want to call out a few, oh, there's a lot of names on there. Well, wow, incredible. Uh, I do want to call out a few special sponsors. Uh, we have Pfizer that we want to thank Amgen Oncology, Seattle Genetics, Memorial Care Breast Center, City of Hope, Orange County, and last but in certainly not least, a huge thank you to the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. And so I'm now very pleased to welcome Dr. Van Etten. Dr. Van Etten is a professor of medicine and director of the Chow Family Comprehensive Cancer Center. He also, because that, that's not enough, directs a research laboratory funded by grants from the National Cancer Institute and National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute. Dr. Van Etten, can you please come to the stage? Thank you so much. Thank you very much, Megan. Um, we're thrilled to be here um, as the co-sponsor and the host of this uh, Metastatic Breast Cancer Conference um, right in our backyard. Um, I want to emphasize exactly who we are, because I think a lot of people in the community may not know us. Despite the fact we've been an NCI-designated cancer center in Orange County for 25 years, the only one based here. So breast cancer is a very important disease to us at our center. You may not know, but breast cancer in Orange County is 20% higher than other regions of California or the rest of the country, for reasons that we don't completely understand. But because of that, we've focused a lot of our research on breast cancer, so that, that spans the spectrum from basic studies um, that, for example, Dr. Lawson does in her laboratory at identifying the very earliest cells with metastatic potential inside a primary tumor. We've also got studies of screening. Uh, so we have the WISDOM study open, which is a study that's testing different schedules of mammography based upon a patient's individual risk. We've also used optical spectroscopic imaging to be able to predict the response to chemotherapy given in the neoadjuvant setting, this is before surgery, um, and shown that that can successfully predict the response. And then most importantly in the treatment arena, for example, in metastatic breast cancer, Dr. Rita Mehta has led a practice changing study through the Southwest Oncology Group of showing that aromatase inhibitors prolong survival in metastatic breast cancer. And the results of that were just published in the New England Journal in May. So we do span the whole spectrum, but we also have a special mission to alleviate the burden of cancer on our catchment area, the people in Orange County. And the person spearheading that is Dr. Changisiri, who's here today. Sora, where are you? There she is. She's our Director of Community Outreach and Engagement. And Sora's group is sponsoring a very uh, innovative program called Advancing Cancer Care Together, which is bringing state-of-the-art cancer prevention and screening including breast cancer, to the federally qualified health centers in Orange County. So for those of you who don't know, these FQHCs, as they're called, are the places where the majority of the uninsured and underinsured people in Orange County get their care. So this is a very important part of our mission. 
So just in closing, um, I know you're all looking forward to a fantastic program today. We're looking forward to hearing from Dr. Soloff about his innovative research. And um, I regret that I can't join you today. I have to catch a plane, um, but I'm sure everybody's going to enjoy the program. And I want to thank Megan again um, for putting on such a fantastic event. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Van Netten, for your contribution and support of the metastatic community. It means so much. Now, it is my honor to introduce someone who so many of you already know and love. This remarkable, remarkable human is a fierce advocate, bringing attention to the unique needs. Well, you already gave the slide. <laughs> but Sandy is a unique, fierce advocate, bringing attention to the metastatic community. and. You really are the one and only Sandy Spivey. Been in involved in so many local and national breast cancer organizations since her stage two diagnosis in 1995 at the age of 42. And after being diagnosed with metastatic stage four breast cancer to her bones in 1998, Sandy began her quest to learn more about the science of breast cancer so she could further influence research. Since that time, Sandy has participate, participated side by side with scientists and oncologists on over two dozen peer review panels for breast cancer research projects. She is a member of UCI's breast disease orientation team where she represents patient voices. She also is an advocate in science for Komen nationally. Please, please help me give a big welcome to your conference chair, Sandy Spivey. Thank you, Megan. Well, we're here again. How many were here last year? How many want to be here next year? And the year after? And the year after? And the year after? Yes, I do too. And I want you all to be here year after year after year. And I want you to all be feeling better and better year after year after year. And I want us to all have more opportunities for high quality of life and, um, and better treatment year after year after year. Um, last year, we made the commitment to support and connect our local metastatic breast cancer community, and that commitment has not changed. But we do need your help. Megan talked about the survey. Oh, no one likes filling out surveys, especially me. My background is in training development, and I had to design these surveys, and I got the feedback back from the surveys, and most of the time, the feedback wasn't very good because it was so sparse. But we really want your words. You know, like my, my um, daughter-in-law says to her three-year-old son, use your words. Please use your words on the evaluation so that we can um, learn more from you. Let's see who we have today. Let's see who's in the room. Okay, so before we do that, who is cold right now? Who's, who's kind of chilly? Okay, the woman right there in the, um, in the beige top. Can I get someone up here to help me? Would you give this blanket to her? She can keep it. I hate being cold. <laughs> that was one of the gifts that was given out at the um, Los Angeles uh, More Than Pink Walk yesterday. That was one of the swag things from Torrid. It was awesome. We need to get stuff like that in Orange County. <laughs> OK, so let's see who's in the room today. Would those of you in the medical community, research, or pharmaceutical industry please stand? Stand, stand. Yes, you can stand. Yes. Thank you. Thank you so much for coming. We can't survive without you. So thank you so much. How about some uh, people who are friends or in support or um, friends of friends of those who are living with metastatic breast cancer? Could you please stand? Again, we cannot survive without that 
moral support and the support of driving us places and telling us, you know, that everything's going to be okay when we feel like our world is ending. So, so um, you know, we, we I can't thank the, the caregivers enough. It, they're they're fabulous, and especially for you to come here on a Sunday. My heart goes out to you. I'm so happy you're here. Now, please stand if you've ever received a diagnosis of breast cancer, no matter what stage. No matter what stage you have been diagnosed with breast cancer. Thank you for coming. Thank you for coming. Did you know that in Orange County, on average, five women are diagnosed with breast cancer every day? This has got to stop. This has got to stop. Okay, stand up if you've ever received a diagnosis of, of metastatic or stage four can breast cancer. And metastatic cancer, for those who don't know it, are cancers that have gone beyond the lymph nodes and beyond the breast, and it's to uh, an organ within your body, like your brain, your lungs, your bones, your liver, and other parts. So I just wanted to make that clear. And who was that that wanted me to say that? You did. Okay, thank you. Thank you for coming. This conference is, is for you. It's estimated that between 20 and 30 percent of all early stage breast cancer patients will eventually receive a, a stage four or metastatic breast cancer diagnosis, not even counting those who are originally diagnosed with metastatic breast cancer. And this, too, has got to stop. You're the focus of our meeting. If you have been living with metastatic breast cancer more than two years, could you please stand? More than two years. That's great. Thank you for being here. How about more than five years? More than five years living with metastatic breast cancer. Thank you. Thank you for coming. You have gone over that hump. That over that hump, that, that annoying hump of the, of the five years, which is, I think is more important than in early stage to get, to get past that. Anyone more than 10 years with metastatic breast cancer? It is possible. How many years? Yeah. 36 years. And how about you? Awesome. Okay, we are the unicorns. <laughs> and we want more people to join the unicorn club. So we have spaces for all of you who have metastatic breast cancer. We want all of you to live and be in that unicorn 20-year-plus club um, and, um, and thrive with us. For those of you who are fairly new living with metastatic breast cancer, be sure to connect with some of those who have been living with the disease for a long time because they can give you, you know, some tips and maybe some ideas about how to live a, a better quality of life. So, you know, don't, don't worry about, you know, am, will I be bothering that person or whatever. Just go up to them and say, hi, I, I have a question for you. Do that with me too. I, I wear this bright, top so you can find me. And if, if you want to talk about anything, please do. Um, and get your questions answered today through peer support as well as through our experts today. So I've been living with metastatic breast cancer since 1998. So it's, it'll be, it's over 21 years. And that's more than half of my daughter's life and nearly half of my married life. I wish I had a magic formula for everyone living with the disease so they can live past the lifespan, you know, to their average lifespan after diagnosis, but I don't. But I want everyone to, um, you know, to be able to live that way, and I want us to have the right resources and the right, um, the right um, treatment so that we can. One of the things that's been keeping me going all these years is my thirst for knowledge and my need to affiliate with others who are living with the disease. I've attended many conferences like this, both nationally and locally, and each time I've connected with new people and have learned new things. I found that I need to write things down. If I don't write something down, it's gone from my brain, like, immediately. <laughs> so please, please, start a to-do list. So that's what I do. I make a to-do I already have, like, five things I need to do, okay? 
Um, but, you know, if you're investing your time here, you should do something with what you've learned. Whether you're going to teach somebody else what you've learned, whether you're going to apply something, whether you're going to talk to your doctor about something, whether you're just going to look up something on a website that you didn't quite understand, please have um, a to-do list. And what I want to do at the end of the conference is ask you what's on your to-do list. And I'll share with, with you some of the things that I have on mine. So now that we've been through some of the details of the program today, I'm pleased to introduce our fabulous researcher and wonderful friend, Dr. Devin Lawson, whose lab is right here on the UCI campus, just down the street, around the corner, to the left, or up to the thing, through the rabbit hole, and then you find her, her in the lab. Last month, uh, Dr. Lawson hosted a group of um, NBC advocates on a tour of her lab. This was the second time she's done that. And it was fascinating, particularly seeing the work that they're doing to help demystify how metastatic breast cancer it's established itself in determining which mutated genes can play a role in metastasis. So you see some of these researchers. There are researchers who have never met anyone with metastatic breast cancer, but they're working on the project. Um, once they meet somebody with metastatic breast cancer, they become a lot more involved in what they're doing because they learn the stories behind um, you know, how we got to where we are today, what our issues are, and we thank them for their work. Um, they don't get that very much. <laughs> they usually get a lot of criticism about, did you think about this? Did you think about that? How come you use this? How do you use that? So it's good for us to remember that there are people in labs working with us probably even today on a Sunday, um, getting things done. You could read about, um, more about Devin and her team's um, work in our guest speaker bio, um, bio handout. But you know, suffice it to say, she knows a ton about metastatic breast cancer. She doesn't have it, but she knows a ton about it. And she's working diligently with her team to come up with discoveries that one day make us, may, may, may help us totally control or eliminate, wouldn't that be nice, metastatic breast cancer, and for that I am so grateful. Devin is our conference host and, and facilitator, and I'm delighted to turn the program over to you so I can complete my to-do list. Devin. Do you want this? Do you want to hold it? Great. Well, thank you so much, Sandy, for that wonderful introduction. Um, it really is an honor to be here um, with you all today. Um, as Sa Sandy mentioned, um, it, it really is true uh, for scientists like myself. You know, we're, we're scientists, actually, who spend most of our time in the laboratory. Um, we're actually not medical doctors, and so we don't have a lot of opportunity to act actually interact with um, patients and the people whose, um, you know, whose lives our research actually we hope to affect. And so um, having you come to the lab and interacting with you like this is really very rewarding for us. And um, you think that it doesn't affect uh, how we do our research, but that's actually not true. Um, Sandy and many of the people who've come to the laboratory really have um, affected the trajectory that our research um, takes. So we are actually listening to you. Um, I hope you, uh, I hope you uh, believe that. <laughs> um, in any case, um, I am very excited, of course, to be here and to work alongside uh, Coleman and advocates like Sandy, who are committed to building a community of support here in Orange County. Um, but now it's time to learn a little bit more about metastatic disease. And um, we have a special speaker here who's traveled all the way um, from the University of Pittsburgh, uh, Dr. Adam Soloff, who is an assistant professor in the Department of Cardiotha Cardiothoracic Surgery in the School of Medicine um, at the University of Pittsburgh. He is also a Coleman Scholar. So um, just a couple of like little, there he is, a little bit bits about um, Dr. Soloff. So he is a cancer and viral immunologist who seeks to translate over 15 years of experience in vaccine development towards creating new immune-based therapies for breast cancer. So working closely, with a multidisciplinary team of basic science researchers, clinical investigators, and care providers. His research uh, strives to develop and translate next-generation immunotherapies, which I'm sure many of you have heard a lot about, uh, for the treatment of advanced breast cancers, um, like those that many of us have here. He feels strongly um, that by empowering the immune system to combat malignant disease, uh, future immunotherapies may augment or potentially replace 
surgical, radiologic, and chemotherapy treatment of breast cancer, uh, dramatically reducing morbidity and mortality. So with that, we'd like to welcome Dr. Soloff to the podium. Thank you. It has been a long day traveling yesterday and up here, and I am just thrilled to get to be here and to share this time with you and to tell you about some of the things that we're doing in the lab. Um, so I'm Adam. If you see me, I'll be here all day. Come talk to me. Ask me questions. This is my email address. Right? Write it down. Email me. Um, if there's things that we can talk about, if there are things that you are interested in, if you want to work together on something, Hit me up, I'll give you my number, and uh, we can start the process. But today we're going to talk about uh, something near and dear to my heart as an immunologist. We're going to talk about implementing the next generation, so the new wave, cutting-edge immunotherapy to treat advanced breast cancer. Right? And I, it's hard for me to share with you how optimistic I am about what we're doing, about what's in the pipeline, about the ability of training the immune system to attack, to hunt, and kill metastatic disease. Um, but hopefully I can share some of that with you and show you why I'm so jazzed about this now. So full disclosure, I consult for Advara to do uh, safety and regulatory work on genetically engineered products that go to clinical trials. So uh, today was, it's gonna be unique, right? I'm gonna tell you about three independent research projects. Normally I would do each one in a separate lecture, right? But I think they're fun, I think they're exciting, and I think that you would be interested in them. So as such, we're going to talk about them. You're going to see a lot of bar graphs that I just don't explain. So if you really want to talk about the bar graphs, come and grab me afterwards. Every bit of the data I will talk about, every bit can explain. It is not to hide it. It's just we got a lot to get through, right? So the first story that I'm going to tell you about is actually the only one that's funded by Komen. So I'm a career catalyst researcher, which is when you're kind of taking that step from junior to full-fledged scientist, and you're supposed to go out and spread your wings. So I have that CCR award, and that was funded by Komen to develop a vaccine that we can use to treat uh, established breast cancer. So my history, my background in vaccine development, we're going to try to test this, give a shot, cancer goes away. The next thing is a much more clinically relevant project, right? So this is something that we're doing in the lab now, trying to get new cell-based therapies into patients today. Right? So we're going to talk about taking the white blood cells from the patients, supercharging them in the lab, and re-administering them to treat them right now. And we're enrolling our first patients in this therapy in the next couple of weeks. So it's awesome. This is much more relevant, much more what can we do right now. The last one that we're going to talk about is my favorite, and it's also the most out there. Right? So we are on kind of that basic research scientific side of developing a drug to get the immune system to specifically target and gobble up metastatic disease. So this is an immune therapy that goes after metastasis directly. I'm super jazzed about it. I think it has the most potential, but it's also the most young, novel, you know, it's the earliest phase in development in the laboratory. But we're going to show you all those, and we're going to talk about them. So a little bit about me, and something that might inform my approach to cancer therapy is I'm not a cancer scientist. So uh, I spent college studying philosophy. I got out, had trouble getting a job, was washing test tubes in an HIV lab, and found that I really liked science. So I, I soon found myself enrolled at the University of Pittsburgh's Graduate School of Public Health. Right? So to me, this is the school that Dr. Jonas Salk built. Salk was the creator of the polio vaccine, and I just idolized this guy. I mean, what a cool idea that you could go in and you, know, you could use your efforts in the lab to try to develop something that can help cure and help people live and survive and lead better lives. So when I joined public health in Pitt, I was working on HIV infections, uh, people living with HIV AIDS, and trying to develop a vaccine that we could use to give that person to cure them of their AIDS, of their HIV infection. And this taught me a tremendous amount. But what I carry from those experiences into cancer is that we need to come up with actual cure shots, right? You know, moving the bar a month or two months is fine, but we need to really drive our efforts into increasing people's lives and making that experience better. And it has to be something that we can get to all people. It can't be a million dollar pill, right? Because that's not very helpful. So we have to find a way to increase the health of the masses, of the masses, right? So that takes us to cancer, right? 
I was actually talking with my wife about whether to show this because this is a very informed and educated group. You guys live this. You know this. But the takeaway here is if you're diagnosed with localized disease, if you have a, meta, a tumor in your mammary gland, right, uh, and it hasn't spread, then the survival is terrific, right? This, that disease is very treatable. But if you have, if you come to the clinic and you're diagnosed with metastatic disease, then the diagnosis isn't anywhere near as good. And I show this because here we're looking at breast cancer and rates that were 10 years ago and rates that were a couple years ago. And that hasn't changed. I will point out that that's not unique to breast cancer. We haven't moved the needle in metastatic disease at all, right? So looking at this as a public health guy, we need to do better. Why aren't we doing better, right? So metastatic disease, I think, has traditionally been looked at like primary tumors. And this, uh, this lady, Patricia Stieg, has a wonderful analogy about it. If you think about cancer as a tree, and the primary tumor is kind of the trunk of the tree and the stalk, and that has all its own mutations, and it's resistant to maybe this drug or that, and it interacts with the environment one way or another. But then when metastasis happens, they're all the branches of the tree. And each one is unique. Each one develops its own special characteristics. Maybe it's not going to respond to this therapy. Maybe it's not going to act the same way its neighbor does. Right? So we have to think about this much like, uh, to me, the HIV problem. We can't just consider this as one thing and done. Right? So we need to take those lessons that were learned. In HIV, we developed a wonderful drug called AZT, and we gave it to patients, and it did nothing. Right? You gave it to the patients, and the virus immediately mutated away. And it wasn't until we paired two and three drugs on top of each other that attacked different pathways, and we have backups to those, that we turned to HIV from a very terminal illness to something that you live with. Right? So why can't we apply that same concept, or why can't we? We need to apply that same concept to how we treat metastatic disease. We need to find multiple routes. We need to say, this is a, a bottleneck, and we can target that. And here's how those things escape. And here's how they get away. And we can target that. And what I'm going to talk about and show you today is how in our laboratory, we're doing that with the immune system and multiple different pathways. There's no reason we can't combine the three projects that I'm telling you about today in one treatment. Right? No reason at all to actually you know, attack this disease on so many different fronts that there's nowhere to escape. And I truly believe that that's how we're going to end this. So as an immunologist, uh, I get this from my mentor, right? Uh, he says to uh, hammer the whole world looks like a nail, right? So as an immunologist, I look at every disease through the lens of immunology, right? But cancer immunology is not the idea of getting the immune system to gobble up cancer is not a new thing. In fact, my, I like to think about the first immunotherapy trial was actually 1865, right? So we have about 150 years of brilliant people working diligently in the laboratory, just tirelessly. Why haven't we come up with something better? Right? Why, why are we still at this point when we're talking about this, having these meetings? We don't want to have these meetings. Right? So I will talk about two pillars that bring us now to what I consider kind of the golden age of immunology. It's taken 150 years of work and dedication and advancements of our own technology to bring us to where we are here. In 2011, what I consider to be the first actual effective immunotherapy was approved. These are things called checkpoint inhibitors, and they essentially take the brakes off the immune system. The tumor is always trying to hide. It's always trying to get away from the immune system. It's protecting itself. We'll talk about that. But these drugs take the brakes off and empower the immune system to go after it. Right. So 150 years, we finally got to that point. This is why I'm optimistic. So if we look at this little graph here, that was 2011. This is the number of new clinical trials that pair checkpoint inhibitors with other things. So in 2011, there were two. In 2017, there were 469, right? So this is just an explosion. This is a revolution of immunotherapy. This chart up here is showing the increase just between 2017 and 18 of all the new trials in the pipeline. So we have a 113% increase in cell-based therapies. 33 in vaccines. And what I'm very uh, kind of bolstered by is we see over here the number of trials that are in the pipeline. So the green ones are trials that are actually approved, or approved agents. Uh, the white are phase three. And we see most of these won't make it. Most of those trials, the phase ones and twos, will be failures. But it's really great to see that there's so much there. We need those new ideas. We need the buy-in from the pharmaceutical industry that says that this is actually a thing. It's viable. And they're going to put resources behind it. And with those resources, we can start to do things. So 
we have that 150 years, what's different now, right? I look at this as kind of these two pillars. Is one, we have a technological capacity to do things now which we could have never done. So we do things in the lab routinely that two years ago would have been impossible, and five would have been crazy, and 10 would have been science fiction. But we can do them. We can look at the, the genetic code of a single cell and everything that it's making. We can, we can visualize how these cells, these metastatic things, are getting away and it, throughout your body, how they're escaping. And that would have been impossible a while ago. So this provides uh, a deeper level of detail and characterization of the biology of metastatic disease than we've ever been able to have. Right? So with that knowledge and our ability to then tailor drugs, therapies, to alter the immune system, to go after it, now we're at this place where not only do we understand the disease, but we can actually start to affect change, which is a wonderful place to be. So we can't really talk about how immunotherapy works without talking about what the problem is. Cancer is so utterly unique in that every cancer cell that arises in our bodies comes from our own body. Right? So it's you, it's yourself. The body's immune system's primary job, its first and most important job, is to maintain tolerance, homeostasis. Right? It needs to maintain balance. It helps tissues develop. It helps wounds heal, but it needs to maintain that balance to make you healthy and happy and able to adjust. Now, the inflammatory response is the other side of this coin. We need it. It is powerful. It is destructive. You get a virus, you get a bacteria, you get a splinter, you need that inflammatory response to protect you immediately so you can fight tomorrow. But if it continues, it's very detrimental. Right? Ongoing inflammation leads to autoimmunity. It damages tissues, damages organs. You get disease. So that's why the body's default is off. Turn it off. That's what we see with cancer. A cancer cell arises, starts to form a little mass. Right? That happens in this low-level smoldering inflammation, just this real subclinical kind of inflammation. It recruits immune cells there. But when the immune cells get there, instead of recognizing that as a target, as something that has to be destroyed and eliminated, virus, bacteria, right? It gets there and it sees itself. That, that mammary cell that's cancerous is part of you. So it gets there and all of the immune the cells, all their buddies that get recruited go, you're in trouble. We have to help you. We have to patch you up. So they start healing that wound. And in healing that wound, they're going to do things like bring in blood vessels, which starts feeding that tumor. They're going to do things like turn off the rest of their immune response. They know we're OK. We just, we're going through some things, and we need some help. So shut off the immune response. So they decrease that inflammation that would actually be capable of eliminating the tumor. And in that process, the tumor hijacks. It subverts our own immune systems in order to grow. It doesn't really know it's doing it. The body thinks it's protecting you and healing, but it's not. It's feeding disease. Right? So what we have to do here is figure out how to change it from the wound healing, the feeding the disease, into that destructive, no, this is, this is alarm. Sound the alarm. This is time to attack. Right? This is context. Right? I don't know of any bad immune cell. Right? It's like there's no single one. They all have specialized purposes. They all have their job to do in the body. But it all depends on what they're seeing. If we have this tumor mass here, this little cartoon of tumor, the same cells that are on the left that can actually destroy it and fight it and attack it, the same killers, are identical in their origins to the ones on the right which support the tumor, which help it grow, which allow it to live. Right? So why? Why are they? And more importantly, how do we change the ones that protect and shield the tumor, thinking you know, this is a wound they're healing, they just need to get over this rough patch, to the ones that go, no, this is bad, this is danger, and we have to kill it. Right? So this is context. But back to that golden age, we are learning how to flip those switches. We're learning how to regulate and change the immune response from the wound healing, from the protective, to the, this is dangerous, you must eliminate it. So those are some of the big things that we have to overcome when we're dealing with tumor immunology. This brings us to our first cell. So we're going to walk through two different cell types. Right? And the first one is the killer T cell. These are the little balls that we see that are surrounding and attacking cancer cells. Right? But they're the little guys. T cells are the foot soldiers of the immune response. They learn. They identify a target. Once they get that target, they will remember it forever. They can last in your body for decades. They are wonderful. You get your polio shot when you're younger. 
They are sitting around 20, 30 years later, and if you are exposed to polio, they're going to come out of the woodwork and fight it off, right? So that adaptive immunity, that memory response, is one of their biggest powers, that they go from one to thousands within seconds. But they are the foot soldiers, they are the primary killers. So I like to show this, and actually, if you're able to roll the movie. So Dr. Jenkins in Australia has this just really pretty example of this. So the long spindly cells that we see in the middle are tumor cells, and she engineered them to glow red when they die. She then mixed them in a dish with T cells that are able to recognize them and kill them. Can we play it over a couple times? And what you see is those little round T cells go up to the tumor cell. They kind of do this handshake, they're feeling it out, they're trying to figure out the, you know, is this good, is this bad, recognize that it's good, and then they kill it. They kill it by shooting in these little cytotoxic packages, these little poisons, right into the tumor, and they eliminate it. And this is great. This is like, so this is what we're trying to do, although we're trying to take that from the Petri dish and a couple cells that we just experimentally throw in to the person. How do we make this happen on a grand scale within an individual? Thank you. So when designing our Komen work, we want to make a vaccine. We're going to use a vaccine that we can administer to people who have breast cancer that's going to generate those T cells that are sufficient, that are capable, that are powerful enough to kill the tumor. Now, I put this up because T cells come in many, many flavors. If you get a splinter, you get one kind of flavor. If you get a virus, you get another kind of flavor, right? I'd like to highlight these guys. TH17s, they're important because they're the most super inflammatory cell I know. And I learned them, again, infectious disease background, because of these guys. When you get a worm infection, and you are in the wrong place, wrong time, you get a worm, those TH17 cells, those super inflammatory cells, are the ones that arise in your body naturally to kill the worm. So to me, these are like the nuclear weapons of the immune arsenal, right? This isn't just a cell that needs to eliminate you know, a virus-infected cell or something like that. These kill tissue. These kill multicellular. So why aren't these? These, to me, are the best ones to say, OK, great, go get that mammary tumor. So how do we target the tumor? There are areas that we've come to understand, even though the cancer arises from you, even though itself, there are different patterns that we can tell are different between healthy and non-healthy. And back in the late 80s, uh, they discovered that this MUC1 is one of those patterns, one of those little flags that stick out. It is actually in this fuzzy part of the outside of the cell, and its job is to keep things away from the cell, right? So it's a protein that's beautifully sugared, and in its healthy state, it looks like this great, fluffy Christmas tree. It's got all these sugars, and it keeps things from the outside from getting in, and that's how it protects you. But when, say, a breast cancer cell becomes cancerous, it loses that sugar, right? Those needles fall off. It's part of the biology of the cancer cell. But what happens is we now get this kind of like naked Charlie Brown Christmas tree looking thing, and that can be recognized by the immune system. That can be targeted, right? So let's do that. That's what we did in this project. We go, great. We're going to create a vaccine to make those worm hunter T cells. And we're going to tell them to go over this, go after this MUC1 that's in breast cancer. And we're going to train them on that, that mammary tumor, and we're going to let them at it. So how do we do this? Right? Well, it's a problem, because your body doesn't want to fight against itself. So we have to trick it. Right? Body knows virus. Virus is never good for you. Body does not like virus. Right? So what we do is we take a virus that causes a common cold. We go in and we chop out parts of its genetics. And in those parts, we put the tumor target, right? We put other molecules that will also jumpstart the immunity and cause those worm killers, those worm killing T cells to come about. We then put that virus in you. When that virus gets in you, it doesn't replicate. We've chopped out its ability to make more of itself. But what it does do is it shows the cell and the immune system the cancer target. Right? So now, all those wonderful alarm signals that happen when you get infected by a virus, like, we are in trouble, come and help us, time to fight, are going off at the same time that your body's seeing the tumor target, this MUC1. Finally, we're going to pair this in a two-prong method. I said, you know, in 2011, the first drug was approved that actually kind of works for cancer immunotherapy. So this was the cusp. We are one of those 469 trials that go, okay, well, we're going to pair them together with something. So not only are we going to make potent immune cells through the vaccination, but we're going to remove the breaks, the inhibition. We're going, to, we're going to take away the tumor's ability to hide by giving this drug. So these checkpoint inhibitors, and I love to show this. This is a gentleman with lung cancer, one of the first to be treated with this class of drugs. 
Here you see a metastatic tumor. He had failed on chemo, radiation, targeted therapies. He had his course of checkpoint inhibitor, and you can see the tumor shrinking, shrinking, shrinking away. So this gentleman with stage four lung is still alive 11 years later, right? No disease. But, but this only happens in 20 to 25% of patients. So we have a lot more work to do to make that 100. So this is one of those bar graphs. So we're on background, and we're finally on to data. All I will say here is we tested it, and it worked. We have a couple vaccines. We have a sham, which is just kind of an empty virus. We have one that t tells the body to fight the muck one on the tumors, and we have one that instructs them to make those worm-killing cells to fight the tumors. Right? And what we see, this is the cytokine, which is an immune hormone that the T cells make when attacking the breast cancer, and that they actually make the right profile. This is really inflammatory stuff. That's the, that's the actual kind of missiles, the, the factors that are going to be capable of killing that worm. right? And we see if we just immunize mice that we transgenically make to be tolerant to muck one so that they act just like you and me. This is a surrogate for immunizing a human. It's still experimental. We don't know how safe it is, right? So, well, it's safe. Don't let me say. So if we immunize them, we do see that we're able to induce that special type of T cells, right? We've done a lot of testing, and this was published a couple years later. So now we need to test it, right? How does this look? We have the regular vaccine, and we have the super worm-inducing vaccine. And what we did is we took a bunch of mice in the laboratory, and we gave them breast cancer. And we waited until they're about stage one, stage two, that there might be regional spread, uh, but fairly large primary tumors. And then we immunized them. This is where we left off two years and a couple months ago when I was here. And at the time, this was something to work on. What these are are survival curves. So the gray one is our sham. The gray one's a mock, right? So it basically says that the majority of animals don't live past 50 days in this model. Their breast cancer becomes large, or they have to be humanely euthanized because of disease, right? Now, if we give the vaccine, we kind of push this a little bit, right? But that's not enough. That's not good enough, right? And if we give the super vaccine, we get about 10% of animals that are able to reject the disease, right? So this is our best offense, right? As we talk about this balance, as we talk about the lessons from HIV, layering, layering treatments, right? This is a powerful, powerful offense, but it's not enough. It's not capable. So then we put on the checkpoint inhibitor drugs, right? These are the drugs that are used in clinic, and we find that we almost don't move the bar at all, right? Same kind of thing. The, the controls which got the sham vaccine pass away. The, the ones that get the regular vaccine pass away. The ones that get the super vaccine were about 10%, right? So this was utterly deflating. But this is how the science goes, right? So you go, why? We went in, and we started looking at those breast cancers and those mice. We took out the tumors. We started in, an in-depth analysis of what's going on. And what we found is, right, each of these cells plays two roles, can fight or can wound heal. And what we found is, even with our best efforts to make these fighters in the periphery, in the outside, when they get to the tumor, they get shut down. They become wound healers, right? That's the default. So they become these things called regulatory T cells, right? So fine, let's target those too, right? So here we are, and we have our checkpoint inhibitor, and we have our vaccine. But what happens if we vaccinate them and knock out those regulatory T cells? Now we start moving the bar, right? So now our vaccine group, maybe about a third, but our control group comes up too. And when we pair the combination, now we're able to cure about 75, 80% of mice in the lab, right? So this is when they have the breast cancer, we're giving them this combination therapy, this triple cocktail, and their tumors just shrink. They go away and these mice live. What I would love to point out here, these guys never received the vaccine. These guys received the two drugs that are knocking down the tumor's defenses, the tumor's ability to hide, no vaccine at all. So that mice is, those mice are capable of rejecting it just because the tumor is now open and exposed to attack. Right? So this is where I think we need to go clinically. We can make the best offense in the world, and they are. Right? Why do we have 100 and some years of trials that have failed? It's not that they're not great trials. There are probably dozens of vaccines that would work really, really well. They just can't overcome the protective nature of that tumor and that immunosuppressive environment. Right? I think that that's truly dominant. So this was very exciting. This was the end of the Komen-funded studies. Right? So we're now trying to figure out how to actually translate this to clinic, how we can give these triple you know, vaccine drug cocktails, and what we're going to do to move that into trials. 
But at that time, that's great. We're working on it. Things need to happen now, right? So we're, the next project we're going to launch into discusses what we can do for the treatment of metastatic breast cancer today. So I am in the Department of Cardiothoracic Surgery. We are a clinical department, and up here is my close colleague, Dr. Rajiv Dupar. Uh, Raj is a surgeon through and through. He is brilliant, and he wants to help. He came to me uh, when I was being recruited to Pitt and said, what can we do? And we've, we've created this kind of symbiosis, right? I jokingly refer to ourselves as the lab rat and the cutter, right? He's the surgeon. I'm the bench researcher. But this allows us, literally, I can walk to his clinic where he's seeing patients meet. We take samples. I can give him new treatments, which we will get into our patients and go back and analyze. This gives us the back and forth to actually bring the things from the laboratory to the patients in a rapid, rapid manner. So Raj came to me and he said, I see a ton of my patients who develop metastases to their chest, their chest wall. These are called pleural effusions, right? So lots of cancers do it, and breast does it a ton. Now, when the breast cancer metastasizes to the chest wall, you can fill up with some fluid. It's very uncomfortable, right? And the standard of care is they drain it, and they discard it, right? So Raj goes, why don't we use this to manipulate? Can we use this? There's white blood cells in there. There's cells that are in a metastatic environment. What can we do to help these patients who come to me that I have no other option for, right? I will point out, this is how an effusion looks. It's cloudy buildup of fluid in the lung. You can label it with PET CT scans. Um, and we recruited two very, very talented cardiothoracic surgeons, or residents, who are now working in the lab, Dr. Akike and Dr. Jobert, who are helping on this project. So what we did here, how can we help these patients? What can we do better for them today? There's a practice called, or a procedure, called adoptive cell transfer therapy, right? Long name, kind of simple concept. You can go in, you can take a tumor, surgically remove it, you can chop it up into little pieces and put it in a dish in the lab. And then you can grow the white blood cells out, right? They expand very well. Those killer T cells, their job is to expand and to go and hunt targets, right? So you can expand them in a lab with the idea that if they were already present in a tumor, chances are they know how to fight. They might not be fighting really well. They might be getting shut off. They might be subverted. But they know how to get there. And maybe in the lab, you can grow them in a healthy environment that allows them to recharge and reinvigorate. So here's an example that was done in the surgery branch of the NCI two years ago of a metastatic breast cancer patient who they removed her tumor. They found the cells that targeted the mutations. They grew them up to the order of 50 to 100 billion T cells, reinfused them to the same patient. And what we're seeing here is a metastasis to the chest wall and liver. And 14 months later, they're gone. So she is uh, in remission with no detectable cancer 22 months out. And this is a treatment for metastatic disease. We have to be very specific. We want T cells that can hunt metastases. We want these immune cells that can directly go after that. So that's what we did. We went in and we started looking at these effusions. There's a large source of cells in there, upwards of billions and billions. We've counted you know, 500 billion per effusion. This gives us a boatload of white blood cells to look at. So there's a whole bunch of different phenotypes. And, uh, we have a very talented student who's worked on this project and figured out a lot of the advanced computational analysis behind it. But the gist of this slide is we find that we have tons of these T cells, these T cells in this metastatic site. We're capable of removing them and growing them very readily in the lab. We take them. We take the patient's own tumor cells. We take the expanded T cells. We put them together in a dish and let them fight it out. Right? Very simple experiment. Like, all the sophisticated stuff we do, letting them fight it out and seeing how it works is about as basic as it comes. But this is incredibly powerful. What we find is those T cells that we take out of that effusion are absolutely capable of killing the metastatic cancer cells, right? So what we see here is the percentage of death um, against either a benign white blood cell of the patient or their actual cancer cells. Uh, and this is a measure of immune reactivity. So now we know that we can take these out. We can expand them. They do really well. They actually look a lot better than the ones that come from solid tumors, because they're probably not in as toxic of an environment. We expand them. We put them back with the metastatic cancer cells, and they kill. So that's what we're doing. That's what we're doing right now. We're looking to enroll our first patients at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center, where we can treat them with this therapy and hopefully get the same responses that they found at the NCI, if not better. Additionally, because we can't stop there, 
we're looking at taking these, taking the cells, and further supercharging them, right? You can grow them and give them back, but what if we engineered them to be even better, to be superior? So we're looking at metabolism, and I think about this as if the tumor is this just horrible, toxic environment, this is like putting little scuba tanks on them, so that when they go down there and they enter this environment, they're still capable of fighting. They still have what they need. They have their supplies, their oxygen, they can get their energy. So we're engineering them in the dish, in the lab, prior to giving them to the patient. Um, we're looking at clonality, right? There's a bunch of different T cells. They're not just all one T cell. This is just a little graph showing the diversity of these things. But we're trying to figure out, are there ones that we can pre-select that are going to be the best killers? Or could we tell who's going to respond or not before by looking at this diversity? And then finally, we're doing the mundane stuff of how best to optimize this expansion for the clinic. So as I said, we're really, really excited because this shows that we can hunt metastatic disease from those uh, breast cancer patients, from their MPEs, and that we can take this to clinic today. And that's what we're trying to do. This brings me to our last project and our last section. Um, this, I have to say, is my absolute favorite. I, I'm just beyond jazzed about this. It's also the hardest to describe for me. So bear with me. And again, if there are any questions, please grab me right after. So these guys are macrophages. We talked about the killer T cells, and the killer T cells are the foot soldiers, right? Macrophages are there from the beginning. Macrophages are your body's natural healers, right? They heal wounds. They help organs grow. When the mammary tissues develop, the macrophages are there, helping those ducts, the milk ducts branch and bud. They are integral into this process, right? Uh, they can also kill. They can also eat things. Like right here, we see a macrophage eating a tumor cell. It's fantastic. T cells don't eat, but macrophages do, which is pretty cool. So why macrophages? Uh, a couple years ago, a collaborator when I was at South Carolina, Dr. Liz Ye, really got me excited about this. This is brilliant and was on to something way, I think, before a lot of us were. But macrophages are important. Okay, They're primary wound healing. They help tissues form. They help tissues develop. Well, if we think about metastases, breast cancer metastases as a process, macrophages are involved at every step of that cascade. So when you have a primary breast tumor, right, cells have to get out of that. They have to get out of the tumor mass, and they have to get into the circulation. And the macrophage is there. Right? They shoot through the blood, have to travel somewhere. The macrophage is holding on to them. They have to get out of the bloodstream, and they, they colonize this little nest which was prepared for them. It's not that they randomly show up. The nest was built before. Macrophages are building that nest. Right? This is all preclinical evidence. Um, so the macrophages, they're priming the nest. And when the metastatic cancer cell drops in there like an egg, they take care of it. They feed it. They nurture it. They protect it from the immune response. And they help that metastasis grow. So every aspect of the metastatic cascade, those macrophages are involved in. Right? So we're going to look at this using a very, very powerful and cool technique. This is not me. This is John Condulis in New York. But what we're going to see is the blue is a mammary tumor in a mouse. The red is a blood vessel. And we see right in the middle one instance where a yellow cell, now a cell, jumps from the tumor directly into the blood vessel. So this is a, a technique called multi-photon intravital imaging, right? where they actually put a window into the tumor so we can examine it in real time on that level. It's amazing. right? So with this technology, we start to build on how these things work. We start to understand deeper the biology of metastatic disease. So why are macrophages important? I'm going to show you two videos to illustrate. On the left-hand side, what we're going to see is green tumor cells, and they're crawling towards the blood vessel. They really want to get there, and they're crawling a like along this string, collagen, down a highway for them. And they're streaming towards that blood vessel, and they really want to get there, but they're not great at it. They're kind of inefficient. On the right-hand side, we're going to add macrophages, right? these helper cells. And we see the same green tumor cell, and we see the macrophages snuggle up with them, and the macrophages start feeding them. They give them factors. They give them signals. And now behind them, it's not one, but it's one, two, three, four, five. We see the tumor cells just stream towards that blood vessel. Right? So this is, one, really neat, but also terrifying, truly terrifying. 
that these dynamic interactions are able to take those cancer cells out of the tumor and shuttle them into the blood, right? But it offers a target. And that's the, that's the ray of hope. That's all of these. These are all targetable factors. The next one. Once they get to the blood vessel, right? It doesn't stop there. Tumor cell has to get in the blood vessel to spread. What we're seeing here, the blue cells of the macrophages again. They're going to grab onto a tumor cell. They're going to pull it with them. They're going to go up against the blood vessel, kind of snuggle up, and they poke holes in it. They grab onto their tumor cell, and they jump into the bloodstream, right? That is called the tumor microenvironment of metastasy. That structure of the tumor cell being held onto by the macrophage, poking the holes and jumping into the bloodstream, is that initial step of metastases. What we see here, using the same technique, are the outside, green tumor cells, blue macrophages, and every once in a while, in this Y, in this crux, what you're going to see is a little flash of red. That flash of red is when they open the door to the blood vessel and they jump through. And that's blood coming out. Right? So now we're able to see and understand and visualize these processes. But focus on these macrophages. They don't mean to be bad. They don't know that they're doing it. But they're helping these tumor cells escape in almost every way possible. So at Pittsburgh, I have the great fortune to work with Steffi Ulsterich and Adrian Lee, who are an awesome couple team. They're married, they're partners, they run a lab together, uh, and they work primarily on metastatic breast cancer. Uh, High-powered stuff, precision medicine, genomics, and we've been working on, great, what do the metastatic sites look like? Right? So we found that, unlike a primary breast tumor, if you look at a metastases, they don't have the same immune infiltrate. They're kind of empty. They're kind of barren, right? Except for one thing. They don't have the T cells, they don't have the other stuff, but they have a ton of macrophages there. So the macrophages, again, she keep on showing up as this target. They're at the sites in our patients. What we're seeing here is a subset of 49 individuals with primary tumors and then metastatic breast cancers that are spread to, this got a little bit jumbly in translation, but spread to the bone marrow, spread to the brain, spread to the GI tract, right? And we see it over and over and over again, that no matter where your breast cancer metastasizes, these macrophages are there, and they're up to no good, right? So this is, to me, where we're going to take a big leap. So one of the gentlemen I worked with back in South Carolina, Dr. Bob Gemmel, started looking at this real basic science thing. I, and I'm an immunologist. I like to look at one cell kill another cell. I like to watch a, a cell eat another cell. But Bob's a, he's a molecular guy. He lives in the lab and looks at, you know, this thing turns on that thing that turns on that thing. It took him two years to convince me that his pet molecule was, um, it was neat. But he finally did. He was working on this thing for years. And what he found is there's an evolutionarily conserved molecule it's called a neuropillin 2. It comes in a couple flavors, A or B. But what this thing does, is it, it causes a cell, all those things that we talk about, the ability to move, the ability to resist drugs, the ability to metastasize, it is capable of turning on all of those switches in the cell. So Bob came to me and goes, you know, I think this is pretty cool. And eventually I agreed. And we started looking at it in these macrophages, right? So this unique switch that allows them to be endowed with all the properties that we hate, right? All those tumor-assisting properties. So first, we did some studies in mice and found that this special type, this special subset of macrophages, is definitely upregulated in breast cancer. We've done human so far. We've done single cell analysis. Here again is in mice, showing that these guys are a unique population uh, and that the ones with the special molecule are close relatives with each other. We've done genetic analysis. All this analysis to say that we believe that this is a special new subtype that we can identify, and either this pathway is driving those macrophages to support the tumor, or at least is a marker for us to go, you are the bad ones, let's do something. Right? So this is the final data slide and the most exciting to me. So um, with this, and we're on to this project, I recruit two bioengineers to the laboratory. Um, this is uh, Amy Powers and Catherine Jones. They're brilliant, and it's very important to always surround yourself with people who are smarter than you. So, they got to doing this work on what exactly this pathway in this molecule does. We look at them eating cancer cells. We look at their metabolism. But the coolest thing that I'm going to show you today is the most boring graph here. This bar graph, or the line graph, right? What we did is we genetically knocked out this pathway in macrophages in the lab, right? We then fed them a danger signal. 
When macrophages respond to a danger signal, they first make tons of inflammatory markers, fighting it, right? They're going to get it. They're going to kill that virus. But after a little while, that has to go down, and the off switch has to come up. The anti-inflammatory has to come up. The resolution has to happen. Otherwise, it would be bad news, right? So what happens when we knock out that special pathway, which we believe is associated with the cells that are making metastases happen? When we knock it out, we see that they can fight, but they lose their ability to turn off. They lose their ability to wound heal. They lose their ability to resolve an anti-inflammatory. So this is why most hardest for me to convey. What this actually means is that if we shut down that pathway and those macrophages, now all the signals that they give that pull the tumor cells into the blood vessel, all the signals that they give to poke holes and jump through, all the signals that they give at that nest to support the metastatic spread go away. And not only do they go away, but their only choice is to be inflammatory. Their only choice is to fight. Right? So now we have two drugs, and regrettably I can't show you them, uh, starting to go through the patent applications, but we have two drugs that specifically target this, that specifically turn off this switch, which we're going to deliver to first animals and then patients to target those macrophages. We're going to stick them in nanoparticles, and we're going to get them there, and the theory, if it holds true, is that this provides a drug that will be able to prevent each step of that macrophage-assisted metastatic cascade. So that might not be enough, right? We might need to pair that with the T cells. We might need to pair that with the checkpoint inhibitors, the drugs, you know, and that's okay. But this at least gives us a method to directly attack metastatic disease at every uh, little stop in its cycle. So right now we do have the two drugs that are in development, and we're hoping that, you know, if I come back in a year or two, that we'll have great news for you. Um, to conclude, and I don't need to tell you guys, again, very educated group, advocacy, right? So advocacy is so important. Uh, I'm a public policy fellow from the American Association of Immunologists, which uh, means I've been groomed to talk and ask for money. Um, but, but really, uh, I've been to Capitol Hill twice in the past couple years, right? And this is the only time, well, the best time for us to make our voices heard uh, Francis Collins, director of the NIH, a couple senators. I meet Tim Scott a lot because um, I was in South Carolina. But this, we need to uh, make sure the voice is heard. There's so many worthwhile endeavors, so many worthwhile projects. But we need to let the government and those know that the funding is essential to keep things going and that it's worthwhile. Finally, I love this. So, why is immunotherapy important? Why do I think this is the next wave? This is going to be the golden age. This is going to cure things, right? So this individual is Emma Whitehead. And Emma was diagnosed with a kind of nasty form of leukemia when she was five, right? Emma was treated at the University of Pennsylvania by Carl June and his team using T cells that they removed from her body, engineered to fight off her cancer, and gave back to her, right? She was one of the first patients to get this therapy, right? That therapy was seven years ago. She's now 14. She's cancer-free. It's brilliant. That drug has been marketed. You can now get it in 25 centers across the country. But I was doing this, and I was updating the picture. And I do this in most of my talks because it's such a wonderful thing. This is what we can do. This is what we're going to. And I realized uh, that when I did it, it started around here, that Emma has grown that she's getting older, she's living. This will be something of her past. She will probably be annoyed that people show pictures of this of her <laughs> when she's a teenager. But to me, this is the success story that we can make happen, right? We're getting there, we're learning, our technical capacity is getting better, improving, but we can do this. So lots of people to thank, lots of scientists, but the most important is our patients and the survivors and the caregivers and the advocates that work with our clinical team, that work with our basic research team, we need that. Uh, and you know, we're all working towards the same cause. So thank you. Uh, and again, if anyone's curious, questions, want to work together, please go ahead and write. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much.
right, great. So, yes, great. Well, thank you, uh, Dr. Sala, for that very inspirational um, uh, presentation. I think it's clear that there's a lot of really cool and very um, innovative and hopefully very successful things in our near future. Um, but for the time being, we're going to take a little quick break, and then we're going to invite our panelists and Dr. Salaf back up to answer questions. So you'll have your chance to um, ask questions. Um, also, feel free to visit him during our 10-minute break. And don't forget to stop by um, the exhibitor booths, including the Pfizer video area. And we'll see you guys in a couple minutes.